quiet as I started just standing here and pacing. You seem to, it was <laughs> very well coordinated, thank you. Um, so before uh, I introduce the closing keynote speaker, I, I wanted to say just a few words. Uh, first is thank you to all of the speakers. I think that we should all thank the speakers for producing such wonderful talks. for coming all the way out here and uh, in, in general just sort of gracing us with all kinds of cool and interesting ideas and uh, being the one half of the hey we should talk equation. And on the other side of that, um, you know, we're going to have to clap again because I want to thank everybody who is here for coming all the way out. We have people coming from the US, people coming from the UK. Uh, most of our attendance is actually from farther away than, than nearer. So first, thank you all for coming. It's, it was an amazing event. So thank you. Um, and, and finally, uh, if you, if, did you guys have fun? Was it, was it good? Did you enjoy yourselves? Cool. Um, if you're interested in doing it again next year, uh, we're going to be in Amsterdam around the same time next year. What? Why are you freaking out? Like, it's not even just one or two people freaking out. It's like eight people in different parts of the auditorium. What's wrong with that? Is that good or bad? <laughs> okay, you can tell me later. All right, at this point, uh, I will introduce our closing keynote speaker who is known for a language that lots of you have used, um, probably more people have heard of than used. Um, it's a little language called Lua. And so, Roberto, Roberto E. Dot. <laughs> please, please welcome Roberto. Well, good evening, or good afternoon, I'm not sure now. My name is Jerusalemsky, I guess. I mean, according to some Russian friends, that's how we say my name, Jerusalemsky. So, Roberto Jerusalemsky. So, I'm going to talk a little about scripting with Lua. So, as she said, Lua, I think, is a language that a lot of people heard about, but not many people no, so I'll give a more general overview of the language. First, when I'm talking about scripting, I'm talking about the original meaning of scripting, like in, in shell languages or in, in TICO, the, of this idea that you usually, you can structure your program using two languages, a system language and a scripting language, and you use the system language for the hard parts of your problem for, for data structures, for complex algorithms. Usually these are the parts that change it less in your program. And you use scripting for the flexible parts of your application, like the, AP, like the user interface and, and things like that. That's things that change much more frequently and you need a more flexible language. But I'd like to emphasize that we use this idea of scripting both because the scripting language gives you some more power in some aspects compared to the system language, but also because it restrains you much more in some other aspects. This is a very important part of any language, what the language prevents you to do, like all type systems, the, the main idea is to prevent you from making mistakes. Memory, automatic memory allocation is the idea that prevents you of, of damaging the memory. And scripting is also mainly with Lua. It's also very frequently used to protect parts of the application because frequently, more often than not, the scripting is used by non-professional programmers like people that are, I mean, they are, of course, progr programmers, but they are not, by formation, professional programmers. They are more involved with the domain of the application. And so scripting is a good way to protect, for instance, in hardware, in embedded systems, is a way to protect the hardware, literally protect the, the, the programmer for burdening the, the device. And the, in software, too, Scripting is a way to avoid the, the, the scripter to interfere with the internals of the software 
they are scripting. A very typical example is in the World of Warcraft, World of Warcraft game that the, the, they offer scripting in Lua for the players. And the idea of, of this Lua interface that anything that a player can do in Lua is not considered invalid in the game. Anything they do outside Lua can be cheating, can be considered a violation of the terms of services of the game. So scripting is also very commonly used in that, in that uh, role to protect something from, from unauthorized or wrong use. This is a, a text from the lead developer of Grim Fandango. Grim Fandango was the first AAA game that used Lua a long time ago. And it gives an idea what we are talking about here when we talk about scripting. This is a very typical architecture of any scripting or of, of many scripting of programs that use Lua, that you have a kind of a, some kind of kernel, some kind of engine behind it, as I said, that take care of the, in the, in the case of games, it take care of graphics, take care of physics, all those complicated parts in terms of algorithms. But the bulk of the game, as he says in, in the middle paragraph, the scripters wrote most of the game. Everything about the game is written in Lua on top of that kernel. What makes the game are the scripters, and as I said, scripters are, are people that are, are very familiar with the game. They are not, as I said, professional programmers in the meaning they, they are not concerned about programming. They are concerned with the game itself, what the game does, what are the characters, how they react in different environments. And so this is the, the whole idea of using Lua in applications. So a lot of uh, areas use that kind of scripting, and in particular Lua for that kind of scripting. In particular, I'll, talk, uh, I'll show some examples of scripting for applications, on embedded systems, and of course, games. So here is just a short list of some programs that use Lua for scripting, and that kind of scripting that you have an application, you can run the application sometimes without scripting or with little part in scripting, but you can extend a lot what you can do with the application using scripting. In particular, there is a politically incorrect example there the, 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 in the right down corner is a, a malware, the flame malware, that is all the, 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 all the software to invade a, a, a host is written in C, C++, but once is in fact a host, you can send scripts in Lua to do whatever you want to do with that host, so again, it's that kind of flexibility that Lua offers. It's not a very good, I mean, as I said, it's not a politically good, correct example, but I think it shows the, 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 the kind of uses and the kind of power, why they chose Lua, we will see later, but they chose Lua for the same reasons that a lot of people choose Lua. Adobe Lightroom is a, another example, this is more politically correct, it's a huge program and again, it has a more than, I mean, most of the program is written in Lua, but it has also a big part written in C, C++ for all the graphics, all the picture manipulation, etc. It's all written in C, C++, and on top of that, we have Lua. And there is a lot of, this is also very, very common in scripting, that it's not that idea that you have the program written in script, in the scripted language, and you have only libraries written in C, C++. You have a lot of communication of C call, calling Lua, Lua calling C, and all kinds of data types being represented sometimes in Lua, sometimes in C, sometimes you have proxies 
in one language to represent objects in the other languages, and the, communi the communication is usually much more tight than the usual idea of, well, you just have a library that you export functions for other languages that is typically used in other script scripting languages. Embedded systems, there is a lot of embedded systems also using Lua. We have Lua on TVs, on, on keyboards, on um, routers and car panels, and et cetera. All of them use Lua for, again, with the, the, this kind of use embedded system is mainly, as I said, to protect the hardware, to make easy because, again, a lot of people programming the, those devices are not professional programmers. They are more concerned or the users or even with the hardware itself. And Lua here protects the hardware and also it makes it easier to, to update the system. It's much easier to change just the script than to change the, 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 whole, the whole software. And of course, games is, is a, a area that Lua is quite famous for. There is a, a, again a short list of games that use Lua. You have some very famous. The, the list is always outdated because I don't keep with new games coming. So it's usually it has some more old games, but it's what I, it's a lot of work to keep this list updated. So why Lua? Why people choose Lua? Why all those applications use Lua? There is a, a lot of reasons, but uh, uh, among the main reasons that I would mention that I talk here are because Lua is portable, Lua is small, Lua is simple, and it has this emphasis on scripting. So what does this mean? Portability means that Lua runs almost everywhere, almost all platforms we heard of. It runs in, in mainframes, in IBM, all kinds of cons game consoles, and all kinds of devices that I talked to, the, like in, in car panels, it runs in, in keyboards, and in cameras, and all kinds of anything that has a CPU and a minimum of memory, you can run Lua, in, it can runs it, it can and runs inside OS kernels. For instance, the NetBSD distribution now comes standard with Lua inside the kernel, so you can op, op, automize some tasks inside the kernel, so you don't pay the price of crossing the kernel. Uh, barrier all the time. So for instance, for package filtering and several other kinds of applications, you can script the kernel. And you have, there is a module for Linux. This is an external module, but also you can link it to the kernel and you can script Linux with Lua. And it runs on the bare metal. I mean, a lot of several devices that don't have an operating system it just, just run Lua on top of the of the hardware. Size, this is a, a, the, the history of Lua in lines of code. Even today, the whole distribution with all libraries, etc., is less than 10, 25,000 lines of code, or less than 10,000 lines of uh, logical lines of code. That translates to, for instance, in my machine, this is a Linux 64 bits uh, Ubuntu. This is the size of the of the executable. It's less than 200 kilobytes, and this is the whole. Again, the, the, it doesn't have extra libraries. This is everything linked statically with all libraries that it uses, etc. This is the the whole of Lua. And if needed, we can remove some libraries that people don't use. For instance, in embedded systems, people usually don't need I.O. libraries, so you can make that even smaller. Simplicity is something difficult for us to argue, but a good proxy for complexity is the size of the reference manual. 
this, uh, the reference manual is quite complete. In Lua, we usually we consider that what, are, what is not in the manual should not be used. So it's not a, something, the manual is not something illustrative. It's really the reference of the language. Sometimes, sometimes people, oh, should, can I use that? And they say, oh, the, the manual doesn't say, doesn't ensure that you can use, but it can change in the next version, et cetera. So actually what most people use on the language is written there. And, this is the spine, this is all you have to learn about Lua. And this is, again, the entire language, the, the API, the libraries, everything is described in these 100 pages. And the idea as a, of scripting, Lua, since the beginning, has been developed as a scripting language. Lua is implemented as a library. It's not a language that we put an API as an afterthought. It is developed as a library. The, the standalone uh, interpreter is just a client of this library, just any other client. So the, 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 the idea of the C API plays a central role in all the design of the language. And for that reason, it's very good for embedding and extending that it's some people have this distinction between whether you have the, mainly whether your, is your main loop. If your main program is C calling some functions in the scripting language that it's called embedding or extending is this other direction that you have the main program in the scripting language just calling libraries in C or C++. And Lua has been embedded not only in C, C++, but, but in all kinds of languages. And in particular, this is funny, Lua it's actually used to script programs written in scripting languages. For instance, in Python, once I gave this a, a talk similar to that for a Python audience, and exactly a guy in the audience called say, I am using Lua, and then after that I learned that a lot of people, exactly for this reason of protection, because if you are, have a Python program and you offer a Python console for a user, he can do whatever he wants with the program. And so if he offers a Lua console, then he can restrict what the user can do, he can only call functions that are registered, that are offered. And that's not because Lua is different from Python. That's because it's very easy to do that in Lua. If you were doing, a, for instance, in Lightroom, that the whole program is in Lua, you can write stuff in Lua, and it's easy to protect your parts in Lua from the other parts of the program. So a lot of people would say reasonably that those goals that I mentioned are more about the implementation than about the language. For instance, size or, or this idea of the API of being portable. And my answer, well, they are not about the implementation. Of, of course, they are a little about the implementation, but there is a lot about the language that allows the implementation to be done in that way. There is a lot of in the project of the language, both related to size, related to portability, and specifically related to scripting that makes the, the, the API and makes the, 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 makes the implementation much easier and more, more viable to be done. So the, our principles, we have, well, of course, if the language has to be small, we have very few but powerful mechanisms. In particular, we use the domain of Lua is built on top of very old and tested principles and mechanisms that are associative arrays, functions, or closures, or lambdas, whatever you want to call them, and coroutines. And we have all, as I said, this emphasis on what we call the eye of the needle, is this idea that we have to pass all constructs of the language through an API with C. 
in particular our basic API, I mean we have APIs for a lot of different languages, but the basic API we see and everything that in Lua should be able to pass through this API, you should be able to do things in C and do things in Lua and as I said, the communication should be easy, should be bidirectional and should be in all levels of abstraction. So we have a quick look at tables. Tables are the name that Lua gives to associative arrays. This is just mostly just associative arrays, but with very some specific features. First, as any associative array, you can use any value as key and then it's value to associate with any value because Lua is dynamically typed. Uh, a table can associate any kind of value to any kind of value. And what it's interesting is that tables in Lua just with some synthetic sugar and some implementation techniques implement all data structures in Lua. We have just tables for everything. So structures or records, it's easy, it's just synthetic sugar to use strings as keys. In particular, Lua internalizes all short strings, so they work as symbols in other languages, so indexing with short strings, it's very fast. Lists and, and arrays, we just use integers as keys. And Lua has a, a very interesting algorithm that it detects that the table is being used as an array and stores the data as an array. It, it, actually, each table can have two parts. One part in, uh, is an actual array, and one part is a hash table, and Lua automatically decides how to distribute the, the keys. So, for instance, if you want to do sparse arrays, you just write sparse arrays and Lua automatically, for instance, if you add an element with a huge index, Lua will not allocate a huge array completely empty. You just put that index in the hash part. And if you start adding other indices, you will put in the hash part until sometime it decides, oh, there is a lot of numbers in, in the hash part. Maybe it's worth moving them to, to an array. Well, Lua offers closures. I mean, he's in quotes because closure is actually an implementation way to, to implement what strangely doesn't have a, a proper name, but it's anonymous functions as first class values with lexicoscoping. Now it's becoming more common in non-functional languages. If, uh, since when we started using closures in Lua, that was not that common in a lot of imperative languages or even object-oriented languages. And even today, a lot of things people call closures in imperative languages have some restrictions. Some languages do not allow you to update outside variables, or there are some restrictions where you can escape the value, etc. Lua has just what you expect from closures to be. And in particular, because Lua has so very few mechanisms, Lua use functions, I mean, the power of functions, uh, of being anonymous, of being uh, first class values, of being lack of having lexical scoping in a lot of places, it's much more frequent, it's not in a lot of languages, closure is a kind of advanced topic or is something extra in the language. In Lua, it's almost from day one, if you start programming in Lua, you'll be using that kind of stuff. In particular, like in Scheme, all functions are anonymous in Lua. When you, in the top is the uh, typical syntax we use to declare a uh, function in Lua. In the bottom is, the, the top is just synthetic sugar for the bottom, so all functions are anonymous, just assigned to common variables. There is nothing special in the name of the function. And all functions in Lua we write are nested to. When in Lua, instead of a eval, 
that it's common in, in dynamic languages, we have a load function that actually returns a function that when called runs the code you gave to, to, to load. So you have that kind of translation, the load would be more or less equivalent and an eval that evaluates your code inside an anonymous function. So there is no notion of main program, all code you write is always inside some function. So of course you can declare local variables that work more or less like static variables in C because they are, they are only visible inside that piece of code, but they, because they are outside any function, they, if functions use that variable, that variable persists among calls to those functions. And modules, for instance, is just a combination of functions and tables, just a, a bunch of functions inside a table, a module. So for instance, when you read, write math dot square root of 10, math is just a glo uh, common variable that contains a table, and that table has a field square root that contains the function that is the square root. So modules come for, for free. And a very important point here is not only this is very cheap, I mean very easy to implement, but that's very easy to pass through the API, as I said, because I didn't mention that, but of course, associative arrays, it's very easy to pass through an API. You just have to offer operations to create the array to access indices and to, to store indices. Functions are trivial, so you just have functions to call stuff. And so it's very easy for C code to create modules or for C code to, to call functions inside modules declare it in Lua, or you can have modules, some functions written in C, some functions written in Lua, so that communication is very, very flexible. So you can, can have all kinds of combinations here. And we have several facilities for free because everything is first class value, so you can give local names to modules, you can give local names to functions, etc. Objects, it's just a combination, again, if you, if you join associative arrays and first class functions, you almost got objects, there are some missing ingredients. So the, the first thing Lua provides is just a synthetic sugar, this is the column syntax that provides a self, both when you call a function and when you declare a function. So, for instance, when you write a column foo is a synthetic sugar that means calls the foo function of a passing a as the self parameter, and you can write the function again using the column syntax like here, function a column foo, and again it puts a self parameter that, that would receive the, the object and operates on top of that object. So this is the, 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 the main part. And the second part is that is something extra. We have a system of delegation in Lua. But delegation is not related to object orientation. It's, we, doesn't, we don't have delegation of methods. We have delegation of field accesses only. This is an idea related to associative arrays, to tables, not related to, to objects or anything like that. And the idea is that you can say that a table delegates access to another table. It only means that if you get a field from table A and it doesn't have that field, then it delegates to B and asks do you, if you have that field, you just returns that to me. And this is all we need to, to implement object orientation and to implement sing, single inheritance. For instance, here is the, the how things work. We have an object A that delegates to an uh, object that behaves like it classes, that because it classes, that it provides the methods for this object. So when you write A column foo, that synthetic sugar for A dot foo, so it tries to get foo in A, A doesn't have a foo, it goes to the class, class does have that key, so it gets that function, and that function then is called with A as the self 
and everything works as expected. And again, as I said, it's very easy to translate that through the API. Again, we don't need anything extra. It's very easy for, from C to call methods or to declare methods in C, et cetera, because everything are just functions and tables. Environments is something that it also is quite nice in Lua. Everybody knows that globals are evil. We should not use globals, but globals are very handy, in particular in scripting languages. For instance, you write A equals three, and then you write in the next line, print A to the 12th power. And in Lua, each line is compiled as a chunk, as an independent piece of code. So if you, do, you can declare A as local, but in the next line, that local is gone, so it wouldn't be very useful. And if A is global, it's okay, you can use that in the next line. And print itself, as I said, every function in Lua is anonymous, so print itself is just a global name of a variable. So if you want to use print, it would be good that we have access to global variables. So what we do is that Lua does not have global variables, but it goes to great lengths to pretend it has. So it, it's a, a kind of, a, at first look, it's a kind of quite complex thing that it does that in the end gives you global variables. So this is what actually happens when you load a function. As I said, this any piece of code, not a function, it's that piece of code becomes the body of an anonymous function. That anonymous function always have an external variable called env. It's an ugly name on purpose. It's underscore env. It's a special name. All functions are always compiled with this local env. And then there is a almost synthetic, it's not synthetic sugar because it needs semantic information, but it's just a synthetic transformation that all three names in the chunk are translated to fields in that env name. So this is completely synthetical. It just, it, it doesn't need, env becomes just a completely normal variable. The only special thing it has is that it's initialized with some value. And so by default, when we don't give anything to load, load passes a global table that is reserved in, 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 inside Lua. And so by default, all modules share a global table. And wh when you write any free name, that name becomes a field in that global table. And so all modules share this idea of global variables, but for instance, when you load a module, you can provide the table that it's going to use. So for instance, you pr provide an empty table, then that module has access to no functions at all. You can provide, I'll talk about that, give more examples in a minute. Of course, you can also use environments by yourself, not through load, because as I said, env is a regular variable. So for instance, if you want to write modules, you want to protect your, your code, you can do that kind of stuff. You declare locals with the stuff that you want to import. Then once you do env equals something, then from that point on, everything, all globals go through the, for instance, if you put env equals nil, you just erase all global names. You can only use the names that you import before in the import list. So some, some common typical uses you can put, as I said, env equals nil. Then you just makes an error any kind of access to, to globals. You can put env equals a new table, empty table, and then you you still you, you cannot use globals, but you can create your own globals. I mean, you use the global names and share in that table. Of course, you can populate that table with some functions, so you can run a piece of code that can only 
call some specific functions that you, you gave the right for it. In the, the last line, we use delegation. You can, for instance, do env be a new table that delegates to the standard global table. So all reads, you can read all global variables, but if you write anything, this goes to the this private table here. And you cannot write to the global table. There is all kinds of tricks that you can do with this construction. And again, as I said, because this construction is done on top of tables and functions, it's very easy to translate that to C. It's very easy in C. I mean, it's everything is compatible, of course. And last, I'll finish with coroutines. Coroutines is a, is a very old, like tables and functions, very old concept. But with several variations, it, a lot of people understand different stuff when you talk about coroutines. And in particular, those variations are not all equiv equivalent. We cannot convert one to the other. In particular, here we are, we are worried, I mean, we want coroutines that are equivalent to one-shot continuations. Those are what we call the good coroutines. Coroutines in Lua, I mean, the basic idea, as I said, it's very common. You just create a coroutine with a body. The body is a, is a function, can be any function. And then you, inside the body, you, when you resume for the first time, the coroutine starts running. And then the coroutine can yields and then resume returns, and then you can resume again in yields, et cetera, et cetera. That's very basic stuff in, in coroutines. What is special, what changes ab among different languages related to coroutines is that first, coroutines in Lua are first class values. That means you can create a coroutine and you can call that, uh, you can resume that coroutine anywhere in your program. Of course, coroutines are just you can store them in variables, et cetera, pass as parameters. But in particular, we can resume them anywhere in your program. And it's what we call stackful. That means that a coroutine can yield anywhere in its execution. So a coroutine can, its body can call a function and calls another function. And you have five, ten levels of calls, and then you yield inside those 10 levels, and when you resume, you are back inside those levels. That's also very important for a lot of important uses that people do with coroutines in Lua. And in particular, coroutines in Lua are asymmetrical because there is this version of coroutines that are symmetrical. We have a kind of transfer that is a kind of go-to, and in coroutines in Lua, we have the resume and yield to separate functions that are more like call return. But it's very easy to trans, not very easy, but it's possible to translate one kind of coroutines to the other. So they are, these two kinds are more like, mostly equivalent. And so coroutines are very, it's very reasonable, simple implementation, mainly are just different stacks. This is nothing very, uh, uh, and the resume is just, just change the stack. Both resume yield is just changing the stack. You have what we call complete coroutines. As I said, it's equivalent to one shot continuations. In particular, we can implement call one CC in Lua, we can write as function call one CC with exactly the same semantics of other languages that have this kind of one-shot continuations. But we think that coroutines present one-shot continuations in a format that is much more familiar to most programmers. I mean, one-shot continuations sometimes is hard to, to understand. Even continuations, it's hard for people to understand. And coroutines, it's very intuitive. It's a kind of it's kind of uh, cooperative multi-threading. So. And what is interesting is that most uses of continuations can be coded as one-shot continuations and, of course, as coroutines. In particular, uh, one of the most common uses is who has the main 
loop problem. There, I mean, in, in programs sometimes it, the producer consumer is a typical example. And sometimes, for instance, you have a program in Lua, you have a program in C, and you want to write both in a style that you don't want callbacks, etc. So coroutine is the perfect thing to turn that around and avoid all kinds of callbacks, and you can do programming. I mean, you have an API that is event-oriented, but you write your program as it would be just a sequential program, and it behave, and everything fits quite nicely. And of course, there are a few applications, usually strange, but some very interesting applications of multi-shot continuations like Oracle functions that you cannot code with coroutines. You pay a price, but it's much easier to implement coroutines than multi-shot continuations. So that is it. So scripting is still a relevant technique for any programmer toolbox. It's still used in a lot of, it's old, but it's still very useful. Language interoperability is not an implementation detail. Of course, you can solve that with a lot of effort, but Lua, as I said, for instance, all those problems they were talking here about JavaScript and the API. In Lua, the API is safe since the, the practically, the, 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 I mean, for 10, 20 years at least, all those problems of memory, memory management, etc was solved, and in part because of this integration of the language with the, with the API. And as I said, Lua has been designed for scripting. The main uses of Lua are all that kind of uses with scripting with some interesting part in C and some interesting part in Lua. And as I said, the, the main constructions in Lua are very easy to port and to pass through the eye of the needle. So it's, this is very interesting. There is a lot of more that I didn't say, but it, for instance, memory management, weak tables, and finalizers. This, Lua has a lot of bunch of other details that help this integration of Lua and C. But the main stuff is this that I presented here. So that's it. Thank you. So, um, what is the current status of the Lua JIT and what is its place in the ecosystem? Ooh. Wow, this is, this is complex. <laughs> Lua JIT is a, a completely separate implementation done by a, a, a brilliant guy that uh, we sometimes suspect are 10 people merged in, in one, nobody, I mean, I, the, the, the closest I got to him is that once I met a guy that claims to have talked on the phone with him once. <laughs> so he can be 10 guys <laughs> quite easily. Nobody saw him, I mean, it's, it's a very strange, story. And he got a, a very good JIT, in part because Lua, it's, as I said, it's very simple, that helps a lot of a, a, a JIT, it's a trace JIT, and, but it's, and, but he's crazy. And now we are having some problems with Lua JIT because one of part of the craziness of Lua JIT is that it's, I think it's unmaintainable at least without him. I think even him is having problems to, to I mean, he's, he says he's, he's living for other reasons, it can be true, but I think it was becoming difficult because the, 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 it has a lot of, for instance, he wrote the interpreter of Lua, he, he wrote the interpreter in assembly, 
just, so it's that kind of, of, of craziness. So it's really fast and it's really, it's really unbelievable fast, but now looking for alternatives, I mean, we, we are looking for something that is not that fast, but we can maintain, <laughs> or someone can maintain, I mean, as I said, he's stepping down and nobody, I mean, there is a lot of people crazy, a lot of companies crazy about Rajit and they cannot find anyone to, to, to even to understand the code, I think it's hard. And it's not big, that's uh, the unbelievable, I mean, it's hard because it's hard, not because it's not big, it's not, it's not size. Um, this is a quite naive question from my side, but um, I would be interested in that. Uh, what do you advise to someone who is getting into this whole like language building thing? Because, for, for instance, I am not like a computer scientist. I didn't uh, like study this topic, but I would be really interested in like trying to build my own language or like getting into this topic. What would you recommend? To, do you mean to, to, to start programming for a, no, uh, no. no, more like um, since like I'm talking more about language design and uh, like the more computer science-y topic. So if you say, okay, I would recommend you definitely read this book about oh, designing uh, this. Oh, about language design? Come on. And implementation, what is a, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good. language design. I, I, I think the, the I, I must say I don't like very much books about language design. I prefer to read designs. I always thought it's very interesting to, 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 to learn languages. I mean, the, the, to learn a lot of languages. This is really interesting. And after some practice, it, for beginners, it's not usually very good, but after some practice, you should get the, the book of the, the, the kind of the author, authoritative book for any languages so you should get any Kernigan and read for C and Stroke Stroop for C++ and read, the, the, read those guys. I think it's the best okay, guide for, I think, uh, an implementation is something kind of way of, yeah. Okay, so with that, let's thank the speaker. And one, one quick thing before you go. Uh, we have a few more Korean t-shirts, if you guys want one. Um, I think I've got a few men's mediums, a few men's smalls, and a couple of sizes left for women. So if you'd like those, uh, meet me at the registration desk and I will, I will hand out the rest that we got. Um, with that, thank you very much for coming, and I uh, hope to see you guys next year in Barcelona. Um, sorry, in uh, Amsterdam. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.